All right, now, the mummy returns. So I remember this is coming out. It was, you know, big, because the mummy was good, and the sequel's coming out, and I, I had already seen the first one, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready for this one to come out. My mom, I remember my mom telling me uh, that Anox and the Moon was going to be in this one. I'm like, no, nah, she dead. Because, well, the, the actress was in the trailer. Well, yeah, there's a way around it. See, a lot of the stuff in this movie makes no sense when you put it in context with the first one, and we'll get to that. So, what's the story here? The story here is now about the Scorpion King. He made a deal with Anubis. After his army was destroyed, he now has the army of Anubis. And they gain victory, but Anubis has control of him and locks him away. And now, uh, these bad guys are after the bracelet of Anubis. You put it on. It tells you where you have to go to Amsher. Because you... You gotta go to each separate place first and can't just go straight from where you are to Amsher, I guess. And once you get there, you have to fight the Scorpion King. If you fight the Scorpion King, then you control his army. Unless, of course, you're O'Connell, it just gets destroyed. The bad guys bring back Imhotep, Imhotep as their champion to fight the Scorpion King and take control of the army. Now, if, like I said, if Imhotep wins, he gets control of the army. But if O'Connell wins, they just go away and the Scorpion King is destroyed. Well, Artist, who's in the first film, he says that uh, they, they, mythology's always weird up in this one. They want to further the mythology. So they say that, you know, uh, O'Connell has a tattoo on his on his arm, and supposedly that means he's a a uh, an, a descendant of the Magi, like Ardeth is a Magi, and so he's a descendant. And then they say that um, in a past life, Evie was actually the second daughter of Pharaoh Seti, the sister of Anaxuna Moon, which we didn't see, and they recreate for us. The beginning of the first film with this time Evie or Nefertiti there. Showing that she was there, she was just in another place. And you, that's why you didn't see her. She was in another part of the pyramid or something, whatever. I don't know, they want to throw that in. What I found confusing that they threw in was that Imhotep now has these. Powers. Now, I know he had, you know, he would become all-powerful in the first one, but we never saw him use any special abilities. Only the plagues of Egypt. That's all we saw, was the plagues of Egypt and those freaking bugs. That's it. The bugs weren't even his thing, but, like, the plagues of Egypt were all the powers that he had. Here, he can, like, it's like telepathics, telekinesis, where he can move people and move things around and, Stuff like that. And he... he my, I don't care that he had, now has this. My problem with it is that they give it to him and then they take it away. He did not have this power in the first one. I guarantee. I don't know how many times I've seen the first one. He did not have this these powers in the first one. And he has them here. Only for when he walks through the threshold of the Pyramid of Amsher, it takes his powers away. He must fight as a mortal. Now what the hell is the point of giving him telekinetic powers in this one? Makes no sense. Another thing that's confusing. Okay, so in the first film, the Americans, they had the, the crate or whatever it is. Box, crate, whatever. And inside are these little Egyptian things that have... Uh, um, Imhotep's body parts in them. 
And that is how they have Imhotep go to each one of them so that he can he regains his his uh his body parts that way. That made sense. Here they have these three thieves bring in the same crate. How they got a hold of it and where they knew it was, I don't know, because it should have been like in some hotel in Cairo or thrown away somewhere, who knows where it was. But they got it. Unless Evie and O'Connell took it with them, but they got it. And then they said, you open the crate, it's a curse. The crate is cursed. You open it up and they would take, they would uh, consume whoever opens it. No, that's not how it works. One, already been opened. Curse is done with. Two, the only reason that Imhotep was going after those people is not because they opened the, the crate partially, but not completely. They each contain a piece of his body parts, what he needed to come back together. It wasn't really about the curse, even though there, there's a curse. They opened it, they were cursed because they opened it, they took the body parts. Steven Summers directed this and the first one. I don't get why directors like uh, Paul S. Anderson, W.S. Anderson, whatever, directed the Resident Evil movies, and there's a ton of mistakes continuity wise in those movies. And it's the same director for all of them, same director for all three of these. You can't remember a simple con continuity three years. Yeah, three years worth, you know, your movie's out there. Pay fucking attention. That's not how the crate worked. They opened it. The curse was released, right? And then, because they had the body parts, Imhotep went after each of them. They opened the crate. Even if it's not about body parts. They opened the crate. And he went after each and every single one of them to open the crate. The curse is done. You cannot then put the lid back on the crate and say, if you open this, it's a curse. It doesn't work that way. The curse has already been been activated when they opened it the first time. You can't just put the lid back on and say, oh, this is curse. No, it doesn't work that way. It's No, that's not how it works. All right? So for all intents purposes, he killed those people to kill those people. It had nothing to do with the box. All right? And this, this this is confusing. In the first film, remember I told you in my first review that the reason, you know, they're going to have Imhotep narrate the first film. But he doesn't speak English, so they had Arleth Bay do it. Arleth do it. Well, in this film, he speaks English. When talking to Alex, the son of Evie and O'Connell, most unnecessary character in the fucking world. But anyway... Most annoying character in this movie, by the way, too. So. He's talking. He starts talking in Egyptian. Halfway through a sentence, he starts talking English. I don't know if, if he was actually talking in English or it translated because that's what Alex was understanding. I don't know, but it makes no sense because he doesn't speak English through the rest of the fucking movie. He's back just speaking, Nai, we the cacao, imut seta. He just go back to speaking Egyptian again. Another only thing, you know, it doesn't make any sense. But, you know. Now, I grew up at these movies. Well, I was in high school. When I was in middle school. 99, I, was, I don't know. But <laughs> I sort of grew up at these movies. And then, which is why I'm going to do the third one soon after Back to the Future Part 3. Because, oh, I got a lot to talk about that one. And I went to the theater to see that one. And it really stayed with me. Now, Alex. Okay. So this this movie takes place nine years after the first one, 
even though it's only been three years since the first one came out, but nine years. They did that with Child's Play. You know, it was eight years, but nine years, eight-year-old boy, my son's eight, but he's not as annoying as this freaking kid, man. Oh, good God. Are they in? Are they in? Are they in? I'm gonna I dwell in Akabaka, whatever his name is, to stab him in the heart. I'm sorry. I could, I could, they, no, they, no. But they couldn't kill the kid, I guess, because they need him. But, uh, yeah. So the kid puts on the bracelet, not knowing what it would freaking do. And this kid has no point of being in this movie unless you put the bracelet on him. So that's why they. That's why they put that on there, because otherwise he's not important to the plot at all. But he had put on the thing, and now he's... So, they put a plot point that you put this thing on, and it shows you where you gotta go. Once you get to that destination, then it shows you the next destination. So, from there they have to... So, from where they are in, in London, they have to go to Karnak. So, they go to Karnak. So, they're on their way to Karnak. Well, in the train, the kid decides, I'm going to try to escape. So he hits the brakes. Why they have a brake thing in the bathroom, I don't know. But he's in the bathroom, he hits the brakes, he goes down underneath where the toilet is, and he runs off. How ironic, ironically, they're at Karnak. Bullshit. One, they would have already stopped. If they were that close to Karnak, they would have already stopped. Because he pulls the thing, they stop, and it's like right there. He runs, and he, it's like Karnak is right there. They would have already stopped. Guarantee you, they would have already stopped. They would have known where they are. They told them where they have to go. They would have already stopped the train. So him having to stop the train, and then I'm already being at Karnak... Makes no sense. All right. So I already touched on the problems with the Scorpion King thing, but let's talk about the Scorpion King. The Rock plays the Scorpion King. This is this was his big break. He played the Scorpion King in this movie, and then he did a solo movie. Why would you have someone with a physical presence as The Rock? I know at this time he was mostly a wrestler. But why would you use someone with the physical presence of The Rock and then only have him for the opening and then the rest is CGI bullshit? Let me ask a question to you, Stephen Summers. Now, after the first film, CGI was terrible. Why would you then do a sequel with even more CGI? There's even more CGI in this one and it's terrible. It's horrible. You'd think by 2002 they would have a little bit better CGI, but no. There's these little pygmies. They're terrible. Uh, um, after... Well, Imhotep swallows the first of the thieves, right? And they show him and he's CGI. He's terrible. He looked better in the first film. I'm telling you, the, the CGI of him changing, like with the thing, looked better in the first film. Because they had the mouth of him not... In the first one, his mouth was still mummified. The mummified mouth. <laughs> well, it looked terrible. It looked better than what they did here. Because they they had blotches of uh, mummifiedness around him. But his most of his face was normal looking. And it was all CGI. And it looked horrible. We get to the big battle. O'Connell versus Imhotep and then versus the Scorpion King. Battle between O'Connell and Imhotep, pretty good. That was pretty good. I was enjoying it. And then he came out. The Scorpion King. Fully CGI. Why did it need to be a CGI Scorpion thing? Did they not learn from what it did back in... Stephen King's It did back in 1990 with the stop motion spider. This is not, no, this is. It came out, and it was a, when it was shrouded in darkness, I'm like, here it comes. And it's shrouded in darkness, it looks alright. Once it gets into the light, oh. 
No. Nope. Nope. That, that, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's awful. It's just, no. Why did the Scorpion King have to be a transmuted half scorpion, half man creature? Why couldn't it just be a man? Emma Tap looked like a regular man. I mean, I know he looked like a mummy thing, but he was a regular man at the end. Why couldn't he just walk out normal? You have someone with the physical presence of The Rock. Even back in 2002, The Rock had a physical presence. You check anything on the mic, in the ring, he had a physical presence. And you make him fucking CGI. Bullshit. Maybe he, maybe he was busy and couldn't come back to film. You know, couldn't, could only film that small part for the beginning and not the main thing. Then don't use the Scorpion King in the end. I know they said he has to, they had the Spear of the Scorpion King. So you have them shove it into where he's kept. Then it explodes. The end. That's all you need to do. If you know that people hated your CGI in the first film, why would you do more CGI in this film? It's terrible. Terrible. I know I've said people need to stop listening about CGI. Nowadays. Nowadays. Back nowadays it's better and people still bitch about it. But back then it's a legit it is it's a legitimate gripe with the way they were back then and people it's terrible. CGI in this film is horrible. It just, there was a part I laughed at though, and it's the part where um one of the bad guys, henchmen, and Jonathan, they're running through the forest, and they run behind these stones, and Jonathan says, These sacred stones, then we'll run behind them, it'll protect us. Are you sure? Yes, I I'm sure. Pygmy comes, runs, jumps over, spears the dude, the henchman, and he's just kind of hanging there. And then Jonathan screams, ah, ah, the Pygmy screams, ah, ah, runs away. Jonathan goes to run away, he looks around, and he goes, sorry, and then runs away. That I liked. Jonathan in this film, a little more annoying than the first film. Because he's in it more. But he's relegated during, towards the end of the film, he's relegated towards babysitter. Basically. Wherever the kid goes, he, he goes. And they recreate a moment from the first film. In the first film, I didn't say this, but in the first review. In the first film, there's this thing about how he's trying to read the book. And he can't figure out a word. And it's a metaphys. So now, they do it again. John is fighting off a Nox and a Moon, and the, you know, fighting whatever, and, um, spoiler alert, Evie gets killed. They, you know, uh, they say that the kid, if they don't get to the, uh, the sunrise on the seventh day at the pyramid, during the sunrise on the seventh day, he's gonna die. So they, O'Connell grabs him, they run in, they jump, he gets there just in time, and then here comes Evie and Jonathan, and... It really confused me because Noxuna Moon and Imhotep come walking in. Noxuna Moon just walks by Jonathan and stabs Evie right in the gut. Did she's right? Did they had to have seen her? It's just and so she dies. But then Alex uses the book to bring her back, and that was what he's doing, and he's trying to read it. Fnay Chakran. Fnay Chakran. I can't get the last one. I, I, I can't figure out the last signal. What is it? It's a bird. A stork. And of course, it's what Jonathan was was looking at in the last one. In the first one. I know that one. What is it? A Manifest. So he says it. She comes back. There's this fight. So, like I said, they make Evie a reincarnation of Nefertiti, the other daughter of the Pharaoh. And when she's brought back, she knows, she magically knows all the fighting moves and everything from back then. With a little bit of Rick's fighting moves, O'Connell's fighting moves too. Now, am I wrong to think that we're going to explore this in another sequel? But when the third one came out, everything got dropped. Because it, this is, it's very throwaway, this, this thing about how she automatically knows everything about her past life. They could have used that in a sequel. But there were things. One, the next sequel came out in 2008. 
which was like, I think it's 2008, isn't it? Can't read shit. I think it was 2008, 2009, one of the two. And they recast the role of Evie with Maria Bello. And that right there is probably the reason why they didn't continue anything from the previous two films. As a completely uh, separate story from the first two, other than the fact that they're the famous O'Connells now, apparently. And I'm getting into the third film, but... Uh, yeah, it, the third film disappointed me. We'll get to that eventually. But this film... It's 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 decent. I'll say that. It's decent. So, let's see. For The Mummy Returns, I'll give it 7 out of 10. It's not as good as the first one, but it gets a 7 out of 10. It's decent. So, what are your thoughts on The Mummy Returns? Let me know in the comments below. Like, share, and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Immune set.